I make social clubs for fun and I hang out with a lot of other folks who do the same. I've been involved with or created around six different social clubs over my life. Sometimes it works, other times it doesn't. I like doing it since it's fun to bring people together and see what happens. However, one of the lessons I've learned is how shocking it can be that you can take different social types of people, put them in the same room, have them see the exact same event, and they'll come out of it with completely different understandings of what just occurred. I was part of a club for talented young people and I helped form another one for influencers in Los Angeles. I was part of two clubs for based intellectuals. The thing that shocked me is that in the first two clubs, including one for successful young people or the people who should be ideally positioned to be leaders and understand the society society's problems on the best level is that when we talk about the outside world, it seemed like we were living in completely different realities. I'm 22 and I think in some ways that gives me an interesting perspective. For my whole life, I've gotten the impression that most people are poor and struggling, that radical ideologues run most of society's institutions, that China, not Russia, is America's greatest rival, that digitization is spread to every aspect of life, and that most young men are screwed with dating. These have just been obvious to me for my whole life since they're the only things I know. However, for older folks who've lived through better times and who often don't want to see the changes I'm talking about, I'm often shocked at how they'll deny things that have just been obvious for my entire life. In some ways, it's not an age thing since I'll talk to the successful young people or LA influencer types and I'll be in complete shock at their inability to realize how ugly things are out there and how siloed they are inside their own little communities. I'll tell an influencer girl what a basic male perspective on dating is or someone from New York City about Pennsylvania's horrible deindustrialization, and I'll be in complete shock that these sort of things have never crossed their minds. This video comes from my realization of the profound myopia and disconnect from reality that much of our society has, and I keep always circling back to one historical example, the French Revolution. The only thing I can think of that connects this well to the foolishness of our era is when Mary Antoinette apocryphally said, let them eat cake to starving French peasants. I think modern America has a series of incredible similarities with this that we'll investigate through this video. When I see modern society and drive around, I see a giant gaping hole with a vacuum inside it that's sucking out our society and no one wants to look at it. It's important to make sure your belongings are safe in times like these, which I'm sure the nobility of the French Revolution would have wanted, which is why I use Shield Wallet, a company that really takes protection to the next level. Shield Wallet offers many different kinds of wallets, all of which offer RFID blocking, preventing wireless theft of your card information. They come in a variety of ranges, including forged carbon and air tack ranges, which allow Bluetooth tracking. Shield Wallet also offers free shipping on all orders, they ship worldwide, and they sell key trays compatible with any wallet. Shield Wallet is an exceptional product for anyone anywhere, and they come with a lifetime warranty and 30-day money-back guaranteed. There is currently a 50% off sale on most available items, and my viewers who use the link below get an additional 5% off. Shield Wallet is a great company with a great product, and I cannot recommend their wallets enough, so get Shield Wallet today. I don't think most people today realize how hard their lives are. Most people just believe whatever they have to to get to the next day, and I really don't fault them for that. Life's really hard, and you gotta do what you gotta do. On top of this, almost no one knows enough about history or human nature to be able to compare our era to anything else. As I like to say, we're fish in a pond that have never seen the outside world, and we don't know what makes our era special. However, I believe that if people realized how hard their lives were, that everything else would fall apart, which is, coincidentally, what I think's gonna happen. Modernity holds itself on a very high horse for having a higher standard of material living to previous eras. However, the average person in America's standard of living has dropped precipitously in the last 50 or so years. The average American lives in what really amounts to poverty today. Half of Americans live hand-to-mouth now with no savings at all. Two-thirds of Americans can't even pay a $400 emergency cost, meaning some minor life crisis could push them over the edge. I once asked my Twitter following how they paid their bills. I make decent money, but I've seen the cost of basic life stuff go up, and I calculated my costs and wondered how normal people just made it. The responses on Twitter were eye-opening. 
Lots of people said they didn't heat their homes in the winter. They never ate out, didn't eat meat, worked multiple jobs, and all that kind of thing. This is the sort of thing working class friends have told me has become normal. The thing that blows my mind is that this was not the life that we were promised. Our society, as Fight Club so presciently said, told us we'd all be rich celebrities if only we worked hard and followed our dreams. The pain is so much more acute given people go on a social media every day and see ludicrous wealth which they will never get. A survey from a couple years ago found the average American worked an 11-hour day, and I guess the numbers are higher now. When I deal with service people like my plumber, Uber driver, therapist, electrician, I see that this has become largely normal from the hours they work. Even college students who should ideally be having fun are working much more than they used to. There's a great book named The Economics of Discontent by Jean-Michel Paul, and it goes through this whole process of how the average person's life has gotten worse. And there's a lot of eye-opening stuff where it's perfectly normal for young Americans to spend a majority of their income on rent. And it's normal for people in the lower half of the economic chain to have debt, which pushes everyone to subsistence level. One of the things that's really shocking is how working Saturdays has become normal. When I was growing up, the weekends were sacred, but recently, whenever I deal with people, I consistently find that most people, even if indirectly with college students doing stuff like studying, work what really amounts to a 12-hour day, six days a week. It blows my mind this is not a topic of national discussion, in that the population's living through Victorian work conditions, and I think it's since people have too much pride to admit how poorly off they are. Throw on top of this how many people are in crippling debt, especially from stuff like college tuitions or paying medical bills, and you see an economically desperate population. I've explained the reason for this decline in standard of living in many previous videos, but the short answer is that this is a very common historic process caused by an overabundance of labor, which stems in our era from the combination of population growth, women's entrance to the workforce, immigration, automation, and globalization. These are all complicated issues with both benefits and drawbacks. However, all of them mean that there's a higher supply of labor so that the average American lives a much worse life than before. I always use this example because I think it's easy for us to forget it, but just look at old TV shows and movies. Homer Simpson in the 80s was a lower middle class loser. That was the whole point of the show, and all of that was normal. Homer Simpson in the 80s had three kids, a stay-at-home wife, owns a house, and goes on multiple vacations a year, and he's considered a lower middle class loser, and that's basically the point of the show. All of that was normal, and now Homer's grandchildren would be working in conditions much more comparable to their great-great-great Victorian grandfathers than to their father in the 80s. Since my background's in history, I often run the thought experiment about if you were to drop someone from a different era of history in the modern world, what would they think? And as a general rule, the modern world values the material world against everything else, while other eras of history put a very strong emphasis upon religion, community, culture, and environment, which we don't. However, if you were to drop someone from any other era of history into our society, they would say that we are failing in all of those categories. In my recent video on mortality, I talk about how humans use religion, community, family, and shared culture to offset economic hardship but none of those exist anymore. Religion has declined precipitously, meaning there's no shared value system today or anything to draw meaning from. Religious people are significantly happier than non-religious people to a degree that roughly equals out to $15,000 a year. There's not a single successful agnostic society in history. Religion creates a way to conceptualize reality and deal with the pain and chaos of a terrifying world. Without it, we're completely lost, and this is a big cause for the almost universal nihilism among young people. A couple days ago, I looked up why is modern society so nihilistic. In the entire first page of results was saying how nihilism is great, and it's amazing and so liberating that we believe in nothing. People often think religion and science are at odds, but the reality is that they play into each other. The reason the West prides rationality is since Christianity does, and as Christianity's gotten weaker, science has declined in the West. It's not a coincidence America is both the most technologically advanced and religious society in the Western world. Communities have completely collapsed. 
People don't even have a concept of community. My friend Greg asked people what a community is, and they consistently got the definition wrong. People just see themselves as a person who lives somewhere and works somewhere. The idea that almost all humans had over history, of having a family and tribe of people who they knew for their whole lives and who would back them, is completely lost. The amount of friendships have collapsed by an incredible amount with around 20% of Americans are the largest group having no friends. Studies have consistently found that interpersonal relationships are the biggest factors in long-term happiness, as well as being one of the most important factors for physical health. Being lonely is the health equivalent of smoking 15 cigarettes a day. Most people don't know their neighbors anymore. People feel completely isolated and like their lives don't matter at all. I've repeatedly mentioned in previous videos how family is one of the most important factors for how society works. How you can use family structure to predict political ideology and social structure. Due to a combination of birth control and the breakdown of religion, the traditional family no longer exists. The norm has been for broken families among the lower and middle classes. My best friends from a working class background and grew up in a plurality white working class community, and he basically knew no families that had two parents together or where the parents weren't doing drugs. Among the more upper social classes, divorce is incredibly common. Almost no young people can afford to have kids. For the first time in history, most people age 30 are childless. Over the historic record, when the average age of marriage gets above 28, you're gonna have a revolutionary major political crisis since humans are biological creatures, and if it's too hard to reach our biological goal of reproduction, they start to freak out. We were designed to breed first and be rational later. The sexual dynamics in modern society are also completely broken. Two-thirds of young men under the age of 30 are single, and I think the number's around 80% for guys in my age category. Median sexual activity among Gen Z's at the lowest level since the Victorian period, when women couldn't show their ankles. One-third of young men under the age of 30 are virgins. 40% of women are on a trajectory to be lonely spinsters for their whole lives. We'll get back to this later in the video, but this sexual depression, which I talk about in this video, is the biggest factor driving revolution today. For young men, sexual frustration is like a tea kettle, and if it isn't directed towards women, it will cause wars and violence. I don't think anyone really understands how dangerous this crisis is for society. On top of this, the sexual dynamic is destroyed by social engineering on part of the left. Young women often act in incredibly irresponsible and entitled ways, given in this culture, if you criticize a woman for anything, you'll be called sexist. And society tells women to project all their anxieties and problems onto the patriarchy. Implicit in the belief that women are perfect, which modern society believes, it results in if there are any problems in your life, they must be someone else's fault and thus men's fault. At the same time, it gives young men no direction in life, thus resulting in few developing their masculinity in healthy ways, creating a class of cold, sociopathic, effeminate, or downright creepy young men. I'm going to cut this segment short since I don't want to rehash ideas I've covered in old videos, but you struggle to find a single institution that works well and properly in modern America. The universities have become ideological indoctrination centers, healthcare has become a tapeworm consuming the whole society's finances, the court systems are biased towards the rich and women, and every form of media has been co-opted by radical leftists. Congress doesn't pass laws, the dating apps don't get people into relationships, and social media leaves people lonely. Our society has tried to substitute real things, like community or natural food, for fake things that are worse quality, like social media or fast food. This leaves a hollow society that doesn't function. This is a lot like the French Revolution, given in both cases, the average person was pushed into poverty, with no opportunity to raise a family, and with every aspect aspect of their culture barely functioning. The only people winning were a very small amount of the very rich, and even they had to deal with the effects of living in a failed society. The system in France didn't work for anyone. The monarchy was broke, the nobility and church felt conned of any real power. The merchant classes felt like they were screwed over by the nobility. Both the nobility and merchants wanted France to be a parliamentary democracy. The peasants were starving. It's much like America, where both sides of the political spectrum and every interest group feels like they've gotten the rotten end of the deal. And long story short, the system is so broken that no one has any incentive to keep it running, which then creates the revolution. I've mentioned this in so many other videos that I'll keep it short. However, the reason I made this video is from Peter Turchin's computer models. 
Turchin is a scientist who used to compile data for when countries have revolutions and found it's pretty easy to predict and is controlled by two variables, those being inequality and median wages. He's been able to use that data to predict when countries in history had revolutions to the point of the exact years they took place in. His computer model predicted the French Revolution, the Roman Civil Wars, the Russian Revolution, and the Black Death. This is some videos I've made to cover this topic in some greater depth. As I've explained before, these secular cycles have occurred every 200 or so years for as long as we have records and always break the previous era of history, ushering in a new one. The terrifying thing is that 15 years ago, his computer model showed America had all the variables lined up for a crisis like this. He predicted at the time that the 2020s would be a very rough decade in America. The scary thing is that the reality has exactly lined up with this. From all these points above, I hope I can show how all the variables line up on a material basis for America having its own political crisis on the scale of the French Revolution. It isn't just possible, it's likely. Before we continue with this video, please humor me for a second for a shameless plug. You all should check out my podcast, Common Ground, which I put on a separate YouTube channel so that it didn't mess up the algorithm on this main channel. And we cover what I believe to be some of the most interesting conversations you can find in podcasts. And we have really cool guests, such as the Libertarian presidential candidate, the CEO of one of the largest geopolitics consulting fund in the world, my manager or the author of Ender's Game. Check out Common Ground on YouTube, Apple Music, or on Spotify. Thank you, and now you can get back to the video. Mary Antoinette probably never said let them eat cake. However, the reason that myth has caught on and stood the test of time is that it's indicative of an elite that is so detached from reality that it is completely incapable of seeing what's actually going on. There's a real difference between having rulers that understand your problems and just don't care, and those who can't even mentally process it. This is something that has occurred in many eras of history, but is also true today. The class's detachment of our current elite always shocks me. At the same time, their complete inability to comprehend the problems that affect most Americans is incredible. <laughs> It feels in modern America as if we have a reality war in which different parts of the population cannot even agree upon the most basic facts. On top of this, their inability to see their complete weakness and impotence is really shocking. That might not be pleasant for some people to hear, but every major conservative public figure, whether Donald Trump, Jordan Peterson, or Andrew Tate, have had literal legal action taken against them, yet there's no equivalent on the left. A horrifying thing that I recently heard is debanking, where Nigel Farage, the guy that pushed Brexit, which by the way, is not really that radical had his bank kick him out and nine other banks refused to work for him. You can't publicly say trans people biologically don't exist or white people have done the vast majority of inventions in the modern world, but if you say kill all white people, you won't be fired from a prestigious journalism job. You can rebel and form an independent state without consequences. The trans movement went from an invention to being law over a period of 10 years. You can see the extreme anti-hate speech laws over much of the West being demonstrative of a leftist elite. An example that we have a leftist elite is that Donald Trump was controversial. Meanwhile, the left has made much more social gains in that time, but none of the actions the left has done is controversial, and controversy always demonstrates who's in power because it demonstrates what the cultural consensus is. The left runs the largest corporations, the government, the media, bureaucracy, a large share of religious and military organizations, Hollywood, the educational system, academia, and basically every other institution in society. These aren't moderate left-wingers either, but rather ones who want to destroy the current civilization and believe that every single element of the society should be based around them. If you disagree with the left in many cases, you'll lose your job, have your home doxxed, and maybe even face physical violence. One of the lessons I've learned is that it's more important to see what someone doesn't say than what they do. Oftentimes when someone screams a certain message, it's just a way to take attention off from something else they're doing. That is clearly the case with the modern elite. Almost no one really stands against minority, sexual, or other identities, which is why the left has been able to be so successful since there's not really any opposition. However, the left has turned this into being the only issue that can be discussed in society today. I remember when I was in college, my professor asked me how my essay on Arthurian literature related back to oppression, since every single thing we wrote in that class had to relate back to oppression somehow. 
Look at how every piece of media, movie, university class, and more has to be built off the left's agenda today. However, this obsession is partially a trick by the elite to take the focus off the problems that are destroying the lives of the average American, or the ones discussed before. Social shaming is thrown around even for causes that have nothing to do with oppression. Being against free trade, globalization, completely open immigration will all make you tarred and feathered as a racist and nationalist. However, those are things that hurt the working class by lowering the value of labor. The great irony is that for this criticism of modern society, I will almost certainly be called a bigot with no analysis of the ideas I'm discussing. Since the left is completely incapable of realizing its own failings or taking any criticism, they're kind of doomed because they can't change strategies for the real world. As I've said many times before, and as explained through this text wall, all of the left's positions benefit the college educated and give them more jobs or power. By hurting the working classes, it lowers the cost of living for the college educated. It's remarkable how leftist positions move from being for the working classes decades ago to openly disdating them. Look at the discourse on the left at the right today. They say right-wingers are all racist and working class people. They literally view the majority populations of their countries with horrific condescension. An easy example of the elitism and classism hiding behind the left is how all the major corporations have aligned with the left. To be a left-winger today involves constantly supporting the largest corporations in the world while saying the majority populations of countries are racist, too traditional, and doing everything wrong if only the experts came in to teach them what's correct. It's really shocking how disconnected left-wingers are from the issues I've mentioned before. One of the things that always gets to me is that if you mention the sexual problems young men have today, left-wingers will reflexively call you an incel. First of all, that's objectively not true in my case, but on top of that, if the majority of your young male population is sexually frustrated and single, you should at least worry about that for your own self-preservation so your society doesn't fall apart and have a revolution. It's impossible to talk about the struggles young men or the working classes face today, given that both go against the sexual and racial agendas, which have suddenly become the only lenses you can view or talk about in the world today. A great irony is that I get a lot of comments from old school Marxists or communists who say, yeah, I agree with your criticisms of the new social justice left, that they don't care at all about the working classes and are completely delusional. I've covered this whole topic in greater depth in this video, but the left-wing elite has given young men absolutely no reason to work with them. The crazy thing is that no one in the ruling class seems to realize how much danger they're in. If I were to tell them about the problems here, they just look at me blankly. One of the logical conclusions I'm completely shocked no one else has reached is that if you tell young men or white people, yeah, you're evil and oppressive or racist or sexist no matter what you do, the next logical conclusion is, I don't give a damn what you think, I'm just going to be racist and sexist. And I can't understand why the left doesn't realize, if we're going to push tribalism for minorities who are the smallest tribes, that's not a good end point. In short terms, the left's alliance of the bureaucracy, women, sexual, and ethnic minorities has no strong shared strength given it's an alliance of losers or the people who didn't get into the previous alliance of power. None of these factions really like each other that much except for their hatred of the traditional culture. However, as said before, the left is no military culture and scorns manliness, meaning it will lose any fight. The left is too scared of using force to remove the homeless from city centers, let alone bloodily put down a revolt. Young men have absolutely no reason to fight for the left, and especially those of strong military fiber. The left literally dislikes the idea of aggression, masculinity, planning, social structure, or having standards. As Mao Zedong said, power comes from the muzzle of a gun, and the left thinks owning guns is morally wrong. Modern young left-wingers have a culture that glorifies anxiety, making excuses and weakness. The idea of leftists organizing militarily, actually having a coherent plan and carrying it out is so laughable, even left-wing late-night shows have made jokes about it. When all's said and done, no one will die for the left. Their coalition includes the government bureaucracy, but not the military. Women will not fight, and neither will most LGBT and weak men. The left is literally a coalition of everyone who doesn't want to sacrifice anything for a cause, since one of their dominant moral tenets is permissiveness. The similarity between today and the French Revolution is a completely incompetent elite with no actual force, which at the same time is incredibly arrogant, looks down upon the population, and the actual problems that face them, 
which will kill their cause. When the French Revolution started, the monarchy was actually incapable of doing anything, and thus lost since the army, merchant classes, peasants, or anyone who could actually use force sided with the rebels, which is where we are today. However, until that point, they could live in their own delusions. Another similarity is that before the French Revolution, the monarchy and nobility were trying to expand their stranglehold over the society. Before the French Revolution, it looked as if the nobility were the way of the future, and laws became more stringent as commoners were excluded from many positions in society. It's similar to how the modern left has been trying to push leftists into every facet of society society only to build up resentment for a reaction that will kill them. This sort of process is normal for these secular cycles. As opportunities shrink and inequality grows, it means that people struggle for fewer good jobs, and thus people try to push their group into power. Hiring policies get sillier, people go to school longer, and you start seeing discrimination, whether by gender or race today or through the nobility during the L'Ancien Regime. At this point, if you want to get a PhD, you have to toe the party line. For corporate hiring, you should be the right race and ethnic and in dating, you have to follow loads of things like being over six feet tall, making over six figures in order to get laid. As this process occurs, it creates politics among the leadership in which only the most docile who agree with the ruling regime get hired, thus resulting in the classic decadent court of idiots completely incapable of seeing real problems, which I talk about in this video. However, on top of this, as people with genuine talent get left out without money or power, and the leadership fossilizes, it sets up the society for revolution which we're going to look at next. There are several different cycles in history. One's generational around 80 to 120 years. There's a bigger one around 200 to 300 years. There's a really big one at 2,100 years. However, part of the reason the parallels to the French Revolution run so close is that for the 200-year cycle, the last time it fully played out was the French Revolution. History has a pendulum that swings back and forth, reacting to the last swing. Me Too and the Cult of the Oppressed is partially a reaction to the Romans in the last cycle, who kept millions of women as sex slaves with no rights. Our era is also partially a reaction to the Nazis in World War I, which we try to reject only to go too far, which will just create the next reaction against that. History is a twisted mirror warping in on itself, in which it partially reflects another era, but it's also broken in a new thing. Our era is a twisted mirror of the French Revolution, since the ideology that won that conflict has since installed itself as the L'Ancien Regime, and now conservatives are the rebels against it. This revolution will be a counter-revolution. It will show the emptiness of the project of equality, standardization, and secularism that has ruled the world since the French Revolution. There was a really popular book before the French Revolution named Qu'est-ce que c'est le troisième état? or what is the third estate? Across European history going back thousands of years, there's been this concept of the three estates, or those who work being the peasants, those who are the nobility and fight, and those who pray and protect the psychology and spirituality of the society or the priests. However, the world by the time of the French Revolution had changed, and the book wrote about what is the third estate, and it came to the conclusion that the third estate was everything. It made money, could fight in battle, explored, and did scientific innovations. As warfare switched from aristocratic knights on horseback to ranks of musketeers, they no longer needed the nobility for war, and as France, which was the first country in the world to do so, thought the decline in religiosity, they no longer needed the priests. This book was incredibly popular and caught on like wildfire. It was a big spur for the French Revolution, given it allowed people to articulate the thought, wait, why do we need the ruling class? I understand the shift has occurred pretty recently, in that 10, 30 years ago, Silicon Valley, Wall Street, and Hollywood are making great innovations. However, as of now, they've become stagnant and bureaucratic. I'll frame it in these terms. What does our ruling class actually add to society that we want? We've already maxed out the benefits for the digital revolution and the stuff we push for now like virtual reality, chip implants, genetic engineering, or AI are viewed by the rest of the population as abominations. I think many Americans would be happy burning AI researchers or genetic engineers in the stake. Academia has become completely ideological. The media makes nothing of value and the economy only benefits the rich. For young, especially white men, they're not being hired anymore due to diversity coordinators. The current elite can be completely wiped out, and I can't really see any negatives. This leads me to a politically incorrect point. Young men do such a disproportionate amount of everything in a society that they're the equivalent of the third estate during the French Revolution. Young men work the most hours, they do the vast majority of scientific and philosophic breakthroughs, they make the new companies, they wage war, they explore. 
People cry over how women make 76 cents for every dollar, but they leave out how men build the buildings, roads, companies, science, countries, religions, philosophies, and more, which you really don't see at all with women. This is taboo to say, but of the top 10 wealthiest women in the world, every single one of them got their money through a man, whether through inheriting or marrying into it. If you line up the greatest figures in every field, whether generals, inventors, philosophers, CEOs, or other high leverage effect jobs, any single honest case, the top 10 would be men. I don't say this to put women down since they have a very important role that modern society completely ignores. Women give life and heart to a society, turning it from an army to a pleasant place worth living. They provide psychological stability and raise the kids. This is the case in every society in history everywhere in the world. So we know that this is biological, not cultural. However, this makes the left scheme of using women to replace men absolutely insane. The left push against masculinity in the dating crisis creates a large, agitated young male population that has absolutely no reason not to destroy them. It's hard to believe how much of the modern left hates masculinity. They call all masculinity toxic and shame men for doing nothing wrong, rather distorted views of their ancestors. These guys have really nothing to lose. I was talking to a friend of mine who's a baby boomer. We were talking about the conservative movement and whether or not it was racist. I said yes and he said no. However, as we talked further, we realized that we meant very different things when we were talking about the right. The old right are not going to be the rebels in this revolution. The old right, or that which existed before Trump, is first of all largely dead and most of it's been co-opted by Trump. The old right was fighting a defensive campaign against the left. It lost a lot since it lacked the left's ideological coherency. And on top of that, the old conservatives were what Samuel Francis called beautiful losers, and they're incapable of being as cynical as the left, which spent the post-war period infiltrating every institution of society. Among young people, I see almost no one who supports the old right. I don't hear a lot of praise for Reaganomics or George W. Bush. The new right, which is emerging right now, is something totally different. I compare it to the Kaiser and the Nazis, in which that they were both conservative but had completely different emphases. This new right is growing so fast in such a palpable way that it's impossible to ignore. This is why we were debating about if the right was racist. For the old right, like George Bush or Reagan, you'd have to go pretty far to call them racist or sexist. If you say that's a privileged thing for me to say, what are you really comparing them to? We are by far the least racist society in history. The Reagan presidency saw a massive rise in women in the workforce while British neoliberalism was spearheaded by a woman being Margaret Thatcher. However, the new right I see that is much more aggressive. I'm center-right, but I'm frequently called a traitor for saying that I like that women have rights, not saying that Jews are destroying society, or not talking about race and IQ. This right doesn't really exist yet, and it's only barely started to manifest with Trump. However, as one of the players in the digital right, I would bet a lot, or thousands of dollars, that it's going to explode massively in the next couple years. There's such a palpable anger and hatred in the rightist youth. I've had to live through this crap, so I know that it's justified to a certain degree, but it still scares me. I hear most young male teenagers treat Andrew Tate as their idol. I go through Instagram and I'll hear random comments under influencer girl saying, why aren't you in the kitchen? This right is moving so fast and is more extreme every single year and is growing. I know very few young men who aren't being red-pilled and don't tilt right. In the same way the L'Ancien Regime made the Jacobins, the left has no clue about the demon it's made. I always feel like older people struggle to understand how angry young men are and how society gives them no reason to not hate it. Almost all young men I know are rapidly descending into nihilism and anger. Life as a young man for the most part involves having no one treat you like a real person, care about your struggles, no dating opportunities, a life of Victorian living and work conditions, people won't hire you due to diversity quotas, the entire culture and education system tells you that you're a terrible person, for nothing you've actually done. When I look at it, it seems like I'm staring at a rotting wound that everyone else is ignoring. I spoke at the beginning at the separate social clubs I've made. What I found is completely staggering difference in social cohesion between right-wing young men and every other group. Creating a social club for infiltrators in LA was horrible since everyone acted so entitled. People would lie to see you flake on events and you learned to have no expectations for them. For the one for successful young people, which lead to 80% left wing, people were so anxious to talk to each other. Every interaction was for status. 
However, in the right-leaning groups, it's the opposite thing. Young men trusted each other. They were happy to go to events. They saw each other as brothers, and everything worked out incredibly well. You see such a higher degree of social cohesion among right-leaning young men because they're incentivized against the status and other bureaucracy of the previous group, which creates a group of young men who trust each other, are competent, and have a plan for the future. As of now among young people, if you go to the left, the selection pressures are towards status, permissiveness, and empathy. Among the right is for masculinity and practicality. And if you just look at those stats, the right has the things that would win a war or a revolution. However, once you select for masculinity and efficiency, you get ruthlessness. However, the thing that worries me is that in this current crisis, young men have absolutely no incentive to not be ruthless because the previous society doesn't give them any bones. And I worry about a horrifying reaction by young, angry men against the old order. This is one of the things that reminds you of the French Revolution. Once the revolution started, there was such a mismatch that the rebels just won. It's comparable in that the ruling class believed themselves to be completely dominant, but actually had very little physical force. This is why it was the French Revolution and not the French Civil War. A key factor is that the army is likely to support the rebels, giving the officers tilt conservative, as do most of the men. This is like the French or Russian revolutions, and why they worked since the army sympathized with the rebels. As was the case with both of these revolutions, as with ours, the top levels of the military were political appointments sympathetic to the old regime. The officers were not, and once it got going, the men were loyal to their officers, not their generals or admirals. I imagine as both sides get more extreme, that the right will tilt more pro-military and the left anti-military, thus making the military's conservative tilt more pronounced. I don't think events will play out exactly like the French Revolution. I have a litany of other videos trying to explain what it might be like, and there are many other parallels such as the fall of the Roman Republic, the Thirty Years' War, the last US Civil War, and more. History is a twisted mirror that reflects what occurred before while also being its totally independent new thing. The truth is, I don't know, and nobody does. When the world's chaotic like today, single events can rapidly change history. We don't have a monarchy or entrenched nobility, and this is also just a completely different situation. However, I thought the parallels to the French Revolution were close enough that they deserve their own video. The French Revolution started when the government was in deep debt and the king convened a council of his subjects and asked them to raise taxes to pay off the debts. The subjects refused without massive political concessions from the monarchy, which would have turned France into a parliamentary monarchy monarchy like Britain. The king then refused, tried to shut down the representatives of his subjects, who then formed their own government and captured the king. This is eerily close to what recently happened. The US just passed legislation raising its debt ceiling, but only barely so, and there are probably many different timelines where it didn't pass. The Republicans passed the legislation with numerous concessions from the Democrats. This worked this time, but we're just kicking the bucket down the road and we'll eventually have to deal with or default on our debts that we're physically incapable of paying. The thing that scares me is that we're at the point where political leaders are more incentivized to have a civil war, which keeps them in power, than compromise for the stability of the Republic. As the population becomes more radical, that's what gets leaders re-elected. At a certain point, it's easier to make aggressive gestures that add up to a civil war rather than bite the bullet to save the republic. On top of this, it's very feasible that Republicans and Democrats grow tired of a Congress that hasn't done anything in 40 years and form their own independent Congresses, which they believe will save the nation. After this follows an economic breakdown, which I think is extremely likely today, due to the massive amounts of money printing we've been doing, as well as just economic change needing to work through. I talk about this full logic in this video. The quality of life collapses, which creates a cumulative effect that results in more radicalism. What afterwards occurred in the French Revolution was a breakdown of law and authority. The poor started burning down the richest properties and even the records of their debt. I just moved from LA to Texas as I write this script, and one of my friends is in the LAPD. He said that they will not protect property, and that's true for a lot of blue cities. And we just saw the BLM looting. Blue cities will burn and the rich lose their property, maybe getting killed. In the French Revolution after this point, France descended into a series of military dictatorship with ideological purges. I don't know if America is going to become a military dictatorship. It's definitely plausible. 80% of Americans support the military and 20% support Congress. 
I think conservative America, as disgraceful as it sounds, might give Donald Trump or a similar leader near dictatorial power in the middle of a terrible civil war. And the left might be run by woke committees like the Thermidorian Committee during the French Revolution. Ideological purges are also completely plausible. People are brutal today, and I could see either side of the political spectrum killing the other. The right would view the left as cancerous to their society and traitors. The left already likes to cancel people and ruin their lives, as well as loot, so I could see them doing that. The modern left is fundamentally a descendant of the French Revolution and communism, and so I also see the same kind of purging everyone who's not a radical, which you can already see in a toned-down version with the modern left today. As the co-founder of my podcast, David Hamilton, says, the guillotine's always thirsty, which is also, coincidentally, my Tinder profile. Afterwards, France became embroiled in wars with all its neighbors except France and then went into a total war economy. I don't know if this is going to happen. However, considering how things look with China, it's not totally out of the question. France conquered a lot of territory and fell to military dictatorship, which is also decently plausible given from the cycles of history, and the extremely strong parallels in Rome and America, which I talk about in this video, with America should soon be sliding to Caesarism. By this point, I hope you can see how this parallel can be taken too far. The truth is we're shooting in the dark, and we don't know. Every year my predictions of the future have changed. I just wish all the best since I know things are going to get ugly. I made this video since the fact that social tensions are at this point, where it seemed like the French Revolution could be completely plausible, is insane to me. I've been to one too many parties with young, sophisticated people talking about crypto or the Kardashians, and if you bring up the struggles normal Americans face or the historic precedent, they'll look at you blankly. A couple weeks ago, I tweeted out the crash as soon, and was related or wrong, but around a third of the comments were, thank God, I can't take this anymore. That's a brutal sentiment, and what's coming next will be worse than what's going on right now, but I can understand where it comes from. With things stagnant the way they are, it's almost unbearable, but if things do change, it's possible they could get better. I'm honestly just tired of the smugness and detachment of our incompetent elites, and when the end does come, I hope to God it's peaceful. I'll tell them that they built the world that they lost. My top criticism of the Obama administration is he created a country that wanted Trump. I know people watching this show will have some role in the events to come. I've done this thesis a couple times, but I do that because I think it's the most important thing. So I'll keep this short. The French Revolution already happened. We saw what happened. Killing people doesn't bring a utopia. It only drives us closer to hell. Just because you're angry doesn't make the worst things and the things you want to do right. Let's all hold each other accountable as young men of honor to decency, pride, and love. The French Revolution, filled with hate in which factions killed other factions, set France up for decades of strife and decline while the American and British civil wars, in which the winners forgave the losers, set those societies up as unified, stable, great powers. As Americans, let's turn to the precedent established by the English speakers, not the French.